Welcome back to the Art of Math. Today we're going to go over Fibonacci numbers and the golden ratio. So to give you guys a little bit of a context, this is continuing our math and nature and art section. We started with exploring infinities and today we're going to kind of going to go on a tangent, introduce or explore Fibonacci numbers and the golden ratio. And we're going to tie in those infinity concepts and the Fibonacci numbers later when we go and look into fractals in a future video. All right. So quick disclaimer, how should you guys sort of use this video? What is this video meant to do? This is a huge topic and I find it super, super awesome and fascinating. This is one of my favorite topics. That said, it's, it can be an overwhelming topic and there's just so much to explore. And then the other thing is there's a lot of mystery still with this topic. So I've actually had a pretty tough time trying to synthesize a lot of information for you guys. So. If I were you, I would use this video as sort of a starting point to explore a lot more on your own. So I'm going to try to hit on a lot of things that you may see if you've explored this before and maybe a few that you're not familiar with. But please don't limit yourselves to this video and I'm going to mention this again at the end but definitely, definitely, definitely look at the links in the description. There will be a lot of links like 25, 30, 35 links and that's really going to be two thirds of this which is you guys going and exploring and looking at those. All right, so that said, hopefully this is a very condensed, you know, introduction to many of the interesting points of this topic. All right, so let's get into it. So Fibonacci numbers, many of you have heard of them. What are they? They are the series 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, so forth. So we can, this is what's known as a recurrence relation, which I'll abbreviate f of n, so this is a series which we'll call f, and to get the nth term, we will sum the previous two terms. So to get the third term, which is a 2, we will sum the previous two numbers, which is 1 plus 1. To get the 5, we'll sum 2 plus 3, 3 plus 5 is 8, 5 plus 8 is 13, 8 plus 13 is 21, and so forth. So to get the next number in this series, you just sum the previous two number. So these are just index numbers and this is called a recurrence relation. I'll include links, so if you guys want to read more about recurrence relations, anything I at all I may say in this video, chances are there'll be more in the description. All right, so that's what it is. Now, what is the golden ratio in a nutshell? So if you look at the ratio of these numbers, so one divided by one is just one, two over one is 1.5, uh, sorry, it's just two, my bad, two, three over two, is 1.5, 5 over 3 is 1 and 2 thirds, which is 1.66, uh, keep going, 8 over 5, and so basically you can keep taking these ratios, and if you do that, you'll notice that the numbers are going to, so this, we start off with 1 over 1, which is 1, then we go to 2, so that, that's a little higher, 3 over 2, which is 1.5, so basically these numbers will fluctuate, but they will converge as you go farther and farther out into the series, and what is this number that we are going to approach as you go infinitely far? That is the golden ratio. Now, let's derive that really quickly. So what, what is it actually? It's one plus the square root of five over two. It's referred to often as phi, the capital Greek letter, phi. And so that'll be our symbol for the golden ratio. And in the first few digits are 1.618 dot dot dot. Now, how do we actually get this? So we said we can call this f of n. So as you go really far out, we're looking at these ratios. So f of n over the previous term should be the same as the previous ratio. So in other words, this statement is not true early on, but as we get really far out, these ratios approach the same number. So that's what we've represented here that let's say this is the thousandth term divided by the 999th term should be about the 999th term over the 998th term. All right, now because this is the sum of the previous two terms, we can replace this with those two. So that's just using the property of the Fibonacci series. Now all I'm gonna do is split this fraction into two so that I can have this fraction plus that fraction. So what is fn minus one over fn minus one? Well, that's just one. 
plus this part. Now, since this appears kind of all over the place, let's give this a name. So we'll just call this x. So if we call this x, notice that this right side is the reverse of x. It's the other way around, so this will be 1 over x. So that means we can replace this whole thing with 1 plus x equals 1 over x. Now we're going to multiply through everything by x, so that's x plus x squared, and the right side becomes a 1. Now we're going to rearrange, move the 1 over. I'm just going to rearrange this so it looks like a normal quadratic. And now all we're going to do is just solve. So use the quadratic formula, solve this. So you have negative b, which is negative 1, plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac. So that would be b squared minus 4ac. So you could plug in all those numbers and hopefully you get 5. So that's going to be 1 minus a negative 4, and that's how we got a 5, all over 2a, a, the coefficient is 1. And so that's how you get this one. Now, uh, give me a second. So, yep, yeah. all right. So you may notice that I've actually have a negative 1 over here instead of a positive 1, but that just depends what you call your x. So if you call your x if we had called this 1 over x instead of, and called this side x, it doesn't really matter, so you should get the same thing. So the square root of 5, let's say, is about 2.3, give or take. And so negative 1 plus 2.3 is positive 1.3. Divide that by 2 is about 0.618. But like I said, if you do 1 over 0.618, you will get 1.618. So if you don't believe me, you could try that. So 1 over 0.618 dot 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 should get you that. So it's just a matter, the reason we didn't get this one is that I've called this one x. You can just call this one x instead and call this one 1 over x and then you'll get that. All right, so that's how you get the exact golden ratio. And just to recap, how do we do that? We thought about what is a series approach and then set the two ratios at the end as we get farther and farther equal. All right, so that's what the golden ratio is. Let's discuss the origins real quick. So the Fibonacci numbers are typically associated with Leonardo Fibonacci uh, who lived around the 1200s. And he published a book which brought, brought it to light. However, it's very likely that many people have independently discovered it. So for example, in the links, I'll, I'll, I'll put a link. There's Sanskrit poetry that dates many, many hundreds of years earlier that has Fibonacci numbers of lines in them. So in other words, this just is the name associated with it, but don't assume that that's the person that necessarily discovered it. In terms of the golden ratio, the golden ratio is actually, could be a lot older. So this goes back to Euclid, at least to Euclid. and. So that's a little bit on the history of that. And the person that actually connected the two or is one of the people responsible is Kepler. So Johann Kepler, the guy that you probably know from astronomy. So he made this connection pretty prominent. Okay, so that's a little bit about the origins. Like I said, there's a ton of links. You can read more about that. Let's discuss why, why is this so cool? Why is this important? Where does this appear? So rather than make a three, trillion hour video on where it appears. I'm just going to give you the letters N, M, A. So that's nature, mathematics, and art. And there's probably other things. So in the links, and I'll go into some actually in this video of some of the nature applications, trees, all sorts of spirals in nature, seeds, flower petals, uh, pineapple cones, uh, sunflower seeds, your, your uncle's mustache. No, I'm just kidding about that one. But Basically, it appears all over. So you can go into nature, go to the beach, look at seashells. You, you will find Fibonacci numbers all over nature. So in the links, you'll find not only a ton of examples, but beautiful diagrams to really hammer home this point. So I'm, you, most of you probably have already seen some of these, so I'm not gonna, I wanna sort of give you guys the most value in this video and just repeating stuff that you can easily find somewhere else is not the best use of our time. So that's the nature part. In mathematics, 
it's a super interesting thing to study. It appears a lot in geometry, so actually if you create a regular pentagon, you will not only get, uh, not Fibonacci numbers, but and you connect all of these, you'll find a lot of golden ratios popping up. So I won't go into that in this video, but like I said, if, you, if you're interested in any single element, I'll try to timestamp the links. So just take a look at the description, there'll be a ton. Art, so it's claimed a lot of artists, musicians, such as Leonardo da Vinci, maybe. There's a little bit of controversy whether it's actually used or not. But supposedly, like the Greek, the, uh, the Parthenon, a lot of architecture, if not directly influenced, was at least kind of influenced by the golden ratio, which is considered a beautiful proportion. And um, I'll let you guys explore that. So just know that it pops up all over, and this is just my little abbreviation. Even the links you'll even find, like a plastic surgeon that swears by it, and he claims that if you adjust people's facial proportions to golden ratio proportion, they'll make them more beautiful. So uh, I have my doubts on that, but well, I'll include that anyway. All right, so let's get to the really interesting questions. And now, to me, in exploring this, like I said, there's a ton of stuff, which will be in the description, but one theme that constantly both excited me and bugged me, and something that I really couldn't get to the bottom of, but I started to get a few insights I want to present to you this kind of debate or discussion and I'm sure there's people out there that know more about this than I do and maybe they can even correct some things if I have some inaccuracies. But here's what really interested me, which is why do these numbers appear so frequently in nature? There's two sides, there's kind of two camps and I think most of the people fall into this optimization camp. So we're going to go into a few examples and this actually relates the origins when I said Leonardo Fibonacci kind of introduced this. This will relate to our first example. He introduced this with bunnies, but there's actually a tree called the sneezewort, which has a very similar thing. So the tree, let's say it grows, and so let's just say, so it, let, let's say it's growing, and then it grows a little more, and then this is the main line, but then it branches off. So here's your one, one, two, this keeps growing, but now this needs to grow as well. So the main line will grow, but it will continue to branch because think of it, this is like really healthy. So why did it have to wait? Let's say it's a baby, then it got strong enough to grow and reproduce. So now it, it keeps on going and it branched off. It's gonna keep on going and branch off. So this is the new kid on the block, so to speak. So it's not ready to reproduce, but in one time step, it will be. So we have one, one, if, you, if you're counting them this way, two, three, this one's, this is the main branch. This is gonna continue to grow this way. Again, spawn off another one. Now this one's ready to reproduce. So, and that now this one is ready to reproduce as well. So if I have, oh, sorry, no, not this one is not yet ready, but this one is. Okay, so that's one, two, three, four, five. So there's five. So again, there'll be a diagram if you want to follow this much more nicely looking links at the links in the description. So that's the tree example, but the original example, or at least the thought experiment that Fibonacci came up with was with bunnies. So let's say you have a pair of bunnies. Now that's uh, not a bunny, but uh, all right, so pretend that's a bunny. Okay, so that's my terrible bunny. So here's your 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 mom bunny and your mom, mother bunny and your father bunny. Now, this is a very contrived experiment because we're gonna assume that there's inbreeding going on and that they reproduce every month. So it's very stylized, but this was a thought experiment. Which, so again, just treat it for what it's worth. So let's say it they're baby bunnies, but it's, so it's gonna take them one month. So let's say they're little M's and little F's. And in one, month now they'll be fully mature males and females now at this point they're going to have a pair of children so think of this we have one pair we're counting the number of pairs not the number of bunnies so we had one pair after a month we have still one pair after another month we're going to have them and we're going to have let let's call these one and one because they are the originals and now they're going to have a set of babies one boy one girl 
So all together we have two pairs. Next month they're going to continue to produce another pair and these babies are going to mature. So there's going to be a total of one, two and their new set of babies so that's going to be three. So I won't run this out but basically you're going to get this. If you don't believe me look at the links you'll see a much more convincing visual description. Again this is a very contrived example but it's an interesting thought. So like you might think well after a year of doing this how many bunnies will there be or how many pairs of bunnies. So that's the actual traditional sort of Western origins of the Fibonacci numbers. The example that he used in his book. All right. So that's the trees and bunnies. Now these are not, but actually there's other examples like with bees. I'll put that in the link. So there, bees actually have a very interesting, like there's queen bees that are, in, you know, that are special bees. So uh, there's more realistic examples. Again, check out the links. So that's the tree and bunny example. Then there's the spiral example, which is, for example, the nautilus shell. Now, actually the nautilus shell is a logarithmic spiral. It's not exactly a Fibonacci spiral, but it ne nevertheless illustrates this example pretty well. So if you have a one by one square and you put another one by one square, then the next square, if you're trying to go around, would have to be two by two. And the next square would have to be three by three. The next square to line up exactly with that border would have to be five by five and so forth. So if you keep doing this, you're going to get all the Fibonacci numbers. Now, also I should mention earlier when we were solving the quadratic equation to derive this, we got a plus or minus. So you may be wondering why did we pick the plus? Well, if you pick the minus, you get a negative number and these are increasing, which is why we picked the positive number ratio. All right, so that's the spiral example. So in other words, it's a pretty natural thing if you're growing in a spiral fashion to maybe have the Fibonacci numbers pop up. And also in terms of the spiral, there is the golden ratio, which has to do a little bit with the rotation of these numbers as they grow. So if you want to read more about that, again, check the links in the description. Then you have seed head spirals. So a great example would be the sunflower. So sunflower seeds have these spiral shapes as they grow. And why might that be, why might that happen? So why not just grow in these nice straight rays? So think about it from a physics perspective. If you have seeds growing all the way out, it's going to get pretty large and it's going to be very heavy. So you want to keep things pretty compact and pretty uniform so to keep stability in it. So the optimization argument would say, well, evolution over time has favored the growth of plants where these things grow in this way because it keeps it stable. It keeps it, it's a basically less of a burden on the plant. Now, that's fine and if you by the way in these Fibonacci spirals look in the description for the beautiful diagrams and visualizations of how these things grow you'll if you count the spirals and this is not just sunflowers on tons of things like pineapples all of pine cones whatever there's a Fibonacci number of clockwise spirals and the neighboring Fibonacci number of counterclockwise spirals so there's two sets of spirals happening at the same time I won't attempt to draw that so just check the descriptions there's plenty of videos, plenty of great stuff there. All right, so that's example three. Example four is really my favorite one and that's where I really wanna focus your guys' attention on this debate of the emergence argument or the heuristic approach. I'm, these are just names I'm giving to it so you may not see these used elsewhere versus the evolution or optimization argument for why this tends to pop up. So let's take a look at a flower and the leaves. So Phyllotaxis, for those of you that are interested, is the arrangement of leaves. That's just the fancy name for it. So let's say you have a flower and you have leaves. All right. Now, the angle between these leaves, if, you, if you're so inclined, you can take your protractor, go out to the field and measure these things. And it, interestingly, it very often tends to be 137.5 degrees. Uh, not exactly 0.5, it's 0.5 dot, dot, dot. So that's called the golden angle. We'll go over in a second why that pops up, how that number appears. But let's think why we want this weird number. If 
imagine you're looking top down at this thing and you're just going by 90 degrees. So you have a leaf, another leaf, another leaf, another leaf. And remember, these are not actually at the same level. We are just looking top down. So they're actually, what, these are getting higher and higher this way. So what, when it comes time to the fifth leaf, if you rotate another 90 degrees, you're gonna cover that first leaf. So that's why you don't want a nice angle. If you pick too nice of an angle, after a few rotations, you're gonna end up in the exact same spot. And why is that bad? Well, the sunlight will be obscured from the leaf below it. So the evolution argument or the optimization argument would say, by picking this golden angle, this weird irrational angle, which we'll go over in a second how we get this, you are optimizing for not blocking sunlight. So you're maximizing the sunlight because by picking this, and again, the links will have great visualization, so I encourage you guys to check that as well. So let's say we're looking top down. So you have your first one, then you have 137.5, then you have another one. It's not exactly 120, but as you keep moving, the next one will, let's say, be here. You are going to be able to intersperse a lot of leaves in a very dense way without obscuring, at least completely obscuring the previous one because Unlike in math, in real life, they actually have a thickness, so you can't tile an infinite amount. So while in math we're drawing these skinny little lines, there will be some partial obscuring, but very much less than if you picked like 80 degrees or 90 degrees. So in a sense, we want the most irrational angle. And why is that the golden angle? I'll do a separate video, which will be a little bit of a hand wavy argument, but pretty mathematical of why phi is considered not just irrational, so clearly this is irrational, it's a square root of five, but it's considered the most irrational. That's not obvious. I'm gonna do a separate video on that. So how do we get this 137.5? So our first way we got phi was just looking at this ratio and setting the ratio of these ratios equal and solving that quadratic equation and out popped that number but you can derive the golden ratio from all sorts of things, like a golden rectangle. So if you pick the appropriate dimensions, A and B, this is only a golden rectangle if when you chop off a square that's A by A, this resulting rectangle, which is now going to be B minus A by A, the ratio of this to that is the same as this A to that B. That doesn't always happen, so that's a special condition, and if you, set those ratios equal and solve, you will again get that golden ratio. So that's one way using the golden rectangle and that's mathematics, but you can use a circle. So in terms of a circle, what's the golden angle? If this arc is A degrees and this arc is B degrees, we want that ratio to be the golden angle. So the ratio of A to the entire circumference is A over A plus B. And now if we divide top and bottom by A, we will get A over A is 1, A over A here is 1, B over A is just B over A, and that is our golden ratio, so we can substitute what we know it is. So that's 1.618 dot dot dot. So if we plug that in here, we'll get 1 over 2.618 dot dot dot, which is about 0.38 something, so about 38% of the circumference. So we want this angle to be 38% of the entire thing. And if you multiply 0.38 by 360 degrees, so take roughly 40% of this number, you should get 137.5 degrees, roughly. So that's how you get the golden angle. Your 360 degrees is the entire circle and that's the fraction of it that we want. So, if we do that, then we will be basically rotating our leaves by this angle all the time. Now, fun little fact, the leaves aren't always arranged at this angle, so there's exceptions, but even a lot of the exceptions have a rule as well. So you'll find, or if you read the links, you'll see that a very common exception is 99.5. Oh, again, this is not exactly 0.5 degrees, and that's called the Lucas angle, or it has to do with the Lucas numbers. So what are the Lucas numbers? Again, read more in the description, but it's very similar to the Fibonacci numbers. We can use the same idea of adding the two neighboring terms, but we could start with other numbers. So we could start with two and one. And if you do that, 
That's all it is. Those are the Lucas numbers. So 2, 1, 3, 4, 7, 11, 18. The ratio will still tend to evolve to the golden ratio. So as you can tell, this is a minor difference, but the concept is the same. We're basically adding two terms to get the next term. So even the exceptions are still this deep mathematical simple fact. All right, so that's flower petals and leaf rotation. And in analyzing this, I really want to focus your attention on this explanation. Why does this happen? We've said that, well, by picking this angle, that's a really good choice because it improves the amount of sunlight. It maximizes the sunlight these leaves are getting so they're not obscuring each other. That's great, but is that the reason the plants are doing it? Like, do the plants know, like, oh, oh boy, let, let, me, let me rotate this by 137.5, that'll do it. That's not, th that's, a gr that's a nice sort of human-centered explanation, but that may not be what's actually going on. Through evolution, perhaps, but I would really encourage you guys to check out this result by, I don't know how to say this, Dua D and Cooter, the scientists. And they ran this really phenomenal experiment which showed that even in a petri dish with non-living things, so they just took metallic drops, there's some magnetism going on. Let's say there's two drops and they're dropping a third drop. If you do this slowly enough, these drops aren't just gonna repel in a trivial linear way they're going to start to arrange themselves exactly like the Fibonacci numbers in the spiral fashion showing this 137.5 degree angle which is pretty shocking and crazy and awesome there's a nice video you can google this result you'll see like a two minute video pretty cool stuff so this suggests that maybe it's just a natural result of biochemical forces that and in fact it's been shown that in plants when they grow the next leaf or the next petal, it basically functions like this experiment. So this is not just like a random thing that's unrelated to plant growth. So the next thing that's trying to grow is similar to this next thing trying to, this drop hitting the, the dish. So my take is it might just be kind of an accident. So a heuristic, which is just a rule of thumb. It's a rule of thumb that plants might be using and there's just an emergence of intelligent things basically by accident. It, it may not be with, you know, like the traditional evolution story where plants have evolved this by sort of doing something not as smart and gradually those died off and then the better ones won out. So again, I, it's not a simple story, at least I wasn't able to get to the full bottom of it. But I really encourage you guys to think for yourselves and maybe, you know, people can chime in, people that are in this field and researchers, let us know what the state of the art is. But, you know, this is a really interesting dissection. And if you look at links, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm making such a big deal about this, you'll find most of the time and effort is spent on this optimization saying like, oh, plants, trees, they're just optimizing for sunlight. Like, yes, that is a end product, but that may not be why they're doing it. That they, they might just be doing it. They have no choice but to do it. They're not making a conscious decision to use 137 point. That is just the emergent result of something. So think about that. I'll, I'll leave you guys to explore that further. All right, let's get into a few final thoughts here. So, the hype. So you'll find Fibonacci going ratios appear all over the place. And especially, I'll link up this wonderful uh, one and a half hour lecture where you fa Fibonacci numbers go in ratio factor fiction. And you could explore this topic more of, are these things hyped up too much? So for example, you might've heard there's the Parthenon. This is my terrible rendition of it. Sorry, my terrible rendering of it. Okay. And so, in math and art, they argue a lot of composers, artists, they're using these special ratios like Leonardo da Vinci's famous drawing of uh, there's the man and the golden ratio tends to pop up. So there's the ratio of like this bone to that bone and it's just all over. So that may be true, but at the same time, I don't want to say that, oh, it's completely hyped up and it doesn't appear a lot. So yes, it appears a ton, but maybe not everywhere where people say it does. So let me give you a quick example of why maybe a little overemphasized where it doesn't belong as well. So if I say 
Oh, you know what? This was built using the golden ratio, and that's why it's so beautiful. It has these nice golden rectangles. Like, take a look. Can't, can't you see this nice golden rectangle right here? Keep in mind that when you do this on a piece of paper, and the video I'll link in the description will emphasize this, this is a little drawing on a piece of paper, so this is going to have some sort of thickness. Now, in real life, if you were to magnify this, this little thickness would be plus or minus a few feet. So you're basically kind of fudging the data. The golden ratio is 1.618, but the true ratio may be 1.5, 1.7, 1.65. Basically, by wiggling your little rectangle around and choosing an arbitrary sort of thickness, you can kind of fudge it to get a ton of ratio. So if you say, hey, the ratio of my finger here to the ratio of this part is 1.618. Well, it might be 1.5, but if your measuring tool is kind of not very precise, you can fudge the data. In other words, if you want to get a number, you will find ways to get it if you look hard enough for it. So there are places it truly appears and then places where it's exaggerated. So you may see, say like, oh, the human face is more beautiful when it's a certain ratio. It might be close. It might be 1.5, 1.7, but you know, I'm not even sure the human eye can tell if it's 1.618 versus 1.619. So I'll leave it at that. Just know that beware of these claims in, in art, architecture, music, where people say, oh, this composer used the golden ratio. Maybe they just used three over two. It might've just been 1.5. Now, in conclusion, so how is this video functioning? We started exploring infinity in this math and nature and art series. Now we've segued into a direct application in nature, Fibonacci numbers, the golden ratio. And then in a future video, we're going to tie all these things in into one of my favorite topics, which will be fractals. So before we do that, there'll be two videos after this one. One explaining why this is the most, quote, irrational angle. Clearly it's irrational. There's a square root of five, but why is this the most irrational angle sort of from this camp argument that, oh, this is the best choice for nature to use because it's so irrational and it's better than square root of three, better than square root of two. So we'll go over that in a separate video. And there's also a really awesome fun fact where there's a formula to actually get any Fibonacci number. So if I want the 47th Fibonacci number, there is a formula that's called the Binet formula. And I'll do a separate video on what it is and how to derive it, how to prove it. All right. So our next video after this Fibonacci video and these two, well, actually we're going to go into chaos. So we're going to discuss chaos and then down the road, get into fractals. But this is really one of my favorite sort of gems of this mini section. And I just want to talk about a few ideas, a few themes that are popping up so you guys can see the relationships. So there's the obvious nature theme. Fibonacci numbers huge play a huge role in nature. Infinity is going to play an interesting role in nature. There's the idea of recursion. So we defined the Fibonacci number in terms of the previous two numbers. So defining something in terms of something else, maybe something smaller, is going to be a theme we're going to see in fractals as well. There's a self-similarity, not in terms of all the Fibonacci numbers, but in terms of, let's say, the spiral. So as we're growing, the shape still looks the same, no matter what scale you're looking at it. So I'll leave it at that. Hopefully, you guys are seeing some of these connections of mathematics, nature, art, and I will see you guys in the next two bonus videos as well as in the chaos video.